The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard And he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. May I speak in the name of God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. I remember rather well the first time that I became particularly curious about Scripture, intellectually curious about it. It was the fourth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. And in an instant, the apostle's exhortation there seemed to accomplish across time and space at least something of its intended purpose. These are the words, and you'll know them very well. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And here it is. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, settled in my spirit that day for some unknown reason as though a fresh idea as though I had encountered an undeniably original statement. It was as though I knew at once everything of what it meant and absolutely nothing. Caught up in this paradox, what I could be certain of is that it felt right and true 
What I could not be certain of is why it felt right and true. And ever since, I've been on the trail of the why, of the feeling of the word. What is the wonder working of this word such that on its hearing, all of me feels free? This being on the trail of the why, of the feeling, of the word, we'll call it theology, might be understood as what St. Anselm called faith-seeking understanding. However, my report almost two decades later is that theology is a fool's game. But was it not also the apostle in his first epistle to the church in Corinth who said, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Here he was talking to the people in the church in Corinth about not being particularly of high nobility or well-educated, but he was drawing their situation directly to Jesus, a peasant Messiah born to peasant parents, itinerant and poor, milling about with the diseased and the demon-possessed, mocked and embarrassingly strung up to die in a gruesome public display of example making. How could that guy be worth anything other than forgottenness? Moses had a similar story. Thrown in a river, found by Pharaoh's daughter, witnessed as a young, as an older man, the Egyptians treating his Hebrew kinfolk poorly, killed that person, fled to an alien land, a fugitive, a runaway, born to a slave people. What is the wonder working of this foolish word? such that on its hearing, all of me is made free. Theologian and New Testament scholar, Trolls Ingberg Peterson has compellingly argued that uh, letter writing for the Apostle Paul was a material affair. By this, Ingberg Peterson means that Paul saw his letter writing as a bodily practice through which the spirit might once more be transmitted. Utterly material, utterly concrete transmission of Paul's conversion stories and his, and his letters to the people who were reading them. That somehow Paul's report on being grasped and grasping God becomes the occasion for the addressees being grasped and grasping in the most literal way. Ingberg Peterson is quick to hedge his bets, though, and further suggests that we cannot make Paul's understanding of the concrete spirit-transmitting character of his letter writing our own. None of us could conceivably believe, Ingberg Peterson argues, that we could be actually sending our spirit to somebody else by means of a letter. Indeed, Ingberg Peterson means that we cannot make Paul's Jewish Stoic worldview our own, out of which that 
kind of bodily materiality of, trans, of the transmission of the spirit comes out of. But several scholars in literary theory and black studies would disagree with Ingberg Peterson to a degree because they would say that actually words have power, biochemical power. They actually shape how we see reality through our reward punishment system. And when words change, people change in particular ways over long periods of time. But there's something in the word that actually changes how we relate to reality itself. But it also is the case that there's, there's something that makes that difficult for us kind of folk to believe. One must wonder if we suffer from too much wisdom and, and not enough foolishness of the Pauline type. One must wonder, that is, if our own techno-scientifically dominated worldview has stuffed our ability to be able to see and hear beyond what seems to be possible. Are we missing out, some of us, on the wonder working of this foolish word because we've sacrificed a certain kind of contact with the materiality and sensibility of creaturely life in exchange for unbridled contact, unmitigated access, and the capacity to be everywhere at once. I'm reading the sermon from my phone. In a 1944 essay entitled Poetry and Knowledge, Martinican poet and anti-colonialist Aimé Césaire wrote that, quote, poetic knowledge is born in the great silence of scientific knowledge. Otherwise, what scientific knowledge doesn't say, doesn't point to, doesn't attend to, refuses, even perhaps represses, that's where poetry happens. Because it must, because there are people and things in those places where science is silence. And often where science, and history has shown us, that where science uses its tools to silence people. Gynecology, anyone? Name any other kind of physical, anatomical science and there was probably a slave person on the other end of that Henrietta Lacks, we know. So anyway, Césaire says, poetic knowledge is born in the great silence of scientific knowledge. That's how we get something like, go down Moses, way down to Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Sci poetic knowledge is born in the silence of scientific knowledge, an impoverished knowledge, I submit, says Césaire. For at its inception, whatever other wealth it may have, there stands an impoverished humanity. That's hard to disagree with. In a word, it is as though our techno-scientifically dominated worldview has estranged us from some deeper longing and capacity to understand, has estranged us from a real sense of creatureliness and sensitivity and tenderness and gentleness, covered over, as it were, by the temptations of convenience and precision and rapid productivity. In a way, this is a world in its dominant frame that either refuses feeling for too long a time or refuses feeling all together. And then there is a season like Lent. 
where on Ash Wednesday we go before priests to be reminded, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That all this world, the great things that people have built, the amazing ideas, that somehow it's made us closer and even further apart. And what a season like Lent does is it gives us the opportunity to delve deeply into what it means to be a fragile creature. What it means to experience one's finitude without running away. To be able to understand that there will be myriad burning bushes in our lives. But they will not be consumed. But perhaps the only way in which one can truly believe that kind of thing, to know it as right and true, is by facing the fact of fragility, is by facing the fact of finitude, is by facing the fact of loss and grief and pain. And this season invites us into that reality and says to us, really, that if we're willing to do it, we very likely may hear, I am who I am. And it's only someone who can face the facts and reach that point of hearing that then can go back out into the world and say, I am sent me to you. But as long as we avoid the truth through quaintness and through refusal to face the fact of fragility, not just our own, but also others, I doubt we'll be able to hear like Moses heard. But my prayer is that for all of us, we may indeed hear and understand in almost an instant the truth of I am who I am and deliver that to somebody else. Amen.